Well, hey, good morning and welcome to Finland Mennonite on YouTube. Glad you could join us again. It is the third Sunday of Advent. And today we focus on the word joy in our sermon series, Deep Longings. Now, in some ways, joy is similar to peace, which we talked about last week. And in, in this way, I mean that, you know what, we can take joy for granted um, when it's present. And yet, the moment we feel we're without it, we, we begin to notice it. You ever, you ever realize that about this? You know, just as we can wrongly define peace as the absence of conflict, we can likewise wrongly define joy as the absence of sorrow or the absence of disappointment. But what if, just like peace, joy is something we can experience regardless of of what is going on in our lives. Whether life is calm or chaotic, whether on a mountaintop or in a valley, whether the sun is shining or a storm is pounding, whether things are going our way or seem to be working completely against us. And what if our own worst enemies in pursuing joy and, and having joy is, well, as ourselves? What if we're our own worst enemy. Now, maybe you're thinking, how, how could that be? Well, I bet you've seen it in action, and maybe you didn't even realize that's what you were seeing. So here's the thing. Have you ever seen a child and an adult at odds over the best way, the best path that leads to joy? Doubtless you have, uh, perhaps in a store, perhaps in your own home, uh, perhaps in your neighborhood, in your family, at a family gathering, right? We know what this looks like because it's usually seen by a, an, an adult with a just kind of a scowl on their face, a child with, with maybe anger or sadness, tears, right? And you can clearly see, hmm, those two are disagreeing about something, right? And that something could be all kinds of stuff, but if we break it down, usually it comes down to, child wants to do something that they think will lead to joy, the parent doesn't want them to do something, and so there's conflict about this, right? They're at odds with each other. Maybe you've experienced this in your own life. Um, here's another example. Have you ever asked somebody for their advice on what you should do in a situation, right? Have you ever asked for advice? Pretty simple question. You probably have. If you're like me, I've asked for advice in a, in a lot of different uh, scenarios, but did you ever, after receiving their advice, go on to somebody else and listen to their advice? And the reason you're doing this is not because you want to get a plurality of opinions to best kind of determine the outcome, but you, the opinion that you got from your first person uh, didn't really line up with what you were hoping they would say. So you go to the next person and they didn't really line up with it either. So you go to the third person, the fourth person, and the tenth person if you need to, until what? Well, until you find somebody who tells you what you want to hear, the opinion you were hoping to have somebody share so that you could go and do really what you just wanted to do in the first place, right? You ever have that situation? I, I bet you have. Now, maybe there's some other examples you can think of in uh, this whole idea of how we can be our own worst enemies uh, when it comes to finding and seeking joy. So if you have any other ways where you see this happen, throw them in, a, in the chat screen, kind of put them in the comment section. You can email me some of these things. Like, let's have a little conversation in this. But think about this. Um, what, what ways have you experienced this in your own life? And here's the final question I have for you this morning before we dive into our text. Um, if we can do this with others, kind of act this way with others. Do you think we can act this way with God with regards to seeking joy? With this whole idea of we're going to seek joy the way we want to, and we'll take or leave advice or guidance or wisdom as we see fit. Well, here's the sobering answer. Yeah, absolutely, we can do this. Uh, you potentially can think of an example where you've done this. And you know what? This morning, what we're going to see, we're going to see not only what God thinks about us when we act this way, but we're also going to see uh, and hear some guidance from him uh, on what he would hope we would do 
right? So not only how does he look on this, what does he think of this, but also some guidance and some wisdom for us uh, to take with us. So that's what we got in store, all dealing with joy. How do we get a life filled with joy? All right, so if you have your Bibles, open them up. We're back in the book of Isaiah. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 30, verses 1 to 18. I'm going to read it all, and then we're going to see what it has to say, kind of break some things down a little bit, and then apply it to you and to me, and uh, see what path God lays down for us to experience this kind of true joy that we all long for. All right, here's what he says, starting in verse 1 of chapter 30. It says, ah, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan, but not mine, and who make an alliance, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who, who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my direction to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh, to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. If you want a really interesting psalm to read, a, a wonderful psalm, write this down. Psalm 91 and this whole idea of the shadow of Egypt and the shadow that he's referring to here. Um, see what Psalm 91 has to say about which shadow. All right, so check that out. Write that down. That's a freebie this morning. What else does he say here? It continues. He says, therefore, sh shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. For though his officials are at Zoan and his envoys reach Hanes, everyone comes to shame through a people that cannot profit them, that brings neither help nor profit, but shame and disgrace. An oracle on the beasts of the Negev, through a land of trouble and anguish, from where come the lioness and the lion, the adder and the flying fiery serpent, they carry their riches on the backs of donkeys. Their treasures on the humps of camels to a people who cannot profit them. Egypt's help is worthless and empty. Therefore, I have called her Rahab, who sits still. And now go, write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book, that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever that they are rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord who say to the seers, do not see, and who say to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Leave the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise the word and trust in oppression and perverseness and rely on them, Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you like a breach in a high wall, bulging out, about to collapse, when, whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant, and its breaking is like that of a potter's vessel that is smashed so ruthlessly that among its fragments not a shard is found with which to take fire from the hearth or to dip up water of the cistern. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you shall be saved, and quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling, and you said, No, we will flee upon horses, therefore you shall flee away, and we will ride upon swift steeds, therefore your pursuers shall be swift. A thousand shall flee at the threat of one, till you are left like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill, or if you've been raking leaves, like that one or two lone leaves that just always seem to find their way back into your freshly cleaned yard. Verse 18, therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. So wow, a lot there, right? But it's pretty direct, and it's definitely definitely applicable to you and to me and to everyone, right? It's relevant to us. What's the first thing that we see here, though? We see God's opinion, right, about us, about how we're acting, about the path that we're choosing. And so what we see immediately is him saying, ah, stubborn children, right? Verse one, rebellious 
people. These are the names that he has for us. This is how he chooses to identify us, right? As stubborn rebels. Now, maybe we think that's kind of harsh, but I have a question to ask you this morning. Are you willing to admit that, like me, if someone says you can't do something, it only makes you want to do it more? Uh, maybe it's a rule. It's just you're not allowed to, and you go, hmm, I don't know. I'm actually more intrigued to try to do it now. Or maybe they just flat out say, you're not able to. Right? I'm five, nine and a half. People go, you can't dunk a basketball. You know what it really makes me want to do? Dunk a basketball. Just to prove them wrong, right? Stubborn. You can't tell me what I can do. Hey, don't go over that way. It's dangerous. Stay out from over there. Oh, yeah? I'll show you, right? It just kind of brings up this stubborn edge to us. Right? It's fascinating. Stubborn children. It's like it's woven into our fabric. But don't miss, in light of the fact that this is not a very flattering way to refer to us, although it's truthful, and we have to kind of own this, don't miss the fact that he still refers to us as his children. Stubborn, maybe, yes, but children, right? Don't lose that title, that name. It's a term of endearment, right? He's, he's basically saying, I'm not ashamed to call you family. I'm not ashamed to own up to being your father, right? That's important to hold on to, right? This is huge regardless of what you've done, regardless of what you might be in, regardless of how messed up maybe you have even made your own life. God still looks and sees a child made in his image. And for some of us, we just need to, we just need to sit on that truth and let it penetrate our hearts and let that truth well up within us. Like that truth in itself should be something to rejoice over. You are a loved child of the creator that even in our stubbornness, he's willing to call you his children, right? And don't miss his response in this. He's pursuing us as his children in their rebellion. He doesn't just let them go by themselves, right? He pursues them. He doesn't give up. And God's not giving up on you either or your situation or what maybe is going on in your life right now. You're his child. He cares very much for you. But you know what? As wonderful as that is, and that is wonderful, he doesn't mince his words either, does he? Right? He still calls us stubborn rebels, so what makes the Almighty refer to us in this way? Well, he tells us. He says, you carry out a plan, but it's not mine. And uh, you make alliances, but not with my spirit. Right? He's already basically, in other words, he says, I've already revealed to you the way to walk. I've already revealed to you the things I expect. I've already revealed to you what is for your good. I've already revealed to you how I want you as people to respond. Right? In this situation, particularly, we're talking about Assyria and the threat of Assyria coming in. He's already told them what he wants them to do. They're not listening. Right? They've devised their own plan of how to respond to this coming invasion of the Assyrians. Right? There's several problems with this whole plan, though. Uh, verse 2 says it's apart from God. They didn't, they didn't even ask him. They didn't even... Go to him. It's completely been brought up, not in his ways, not in his will, not in his word, right? It's apart from him. Uh, verse 6 is it's full of danger, right? Not only did you not consult me, the idea you came up with is, is wrought with danger and, and many opportunities for bad things to happen. Verses 3 and 7 say, and it's doomed to fail. You're trusting in something that cannot overcome. You're, you're putting your hope in something that will not succeed. It's apart from me. It's full of danger and it's doomed to fail. And yet it's astounding what you and I are willing to go through to endure if we believe something will work. I mean, look at what it says they're willing to do, right? There's a sort of caravan that he, that he pictures. He's like, you're willing to go through a land of trouble and anguish? You're willing to go where there's lions and lionesses, where there's dangerous poisonous adders and serpents and you're gonna put all your riches on the back of donkeys and camels where there's marauders and robbers like you're gonna 
You're going to put all that in jeopardy over a doomed plan? Like, why would you do that? Well, because we're stubborn children. This is going to work. And so we devise our plans our own and we stick to them, even through dangerous situations, danger to you, danger to me, danger to those around us, uh, things that are doomed to fail, we hold on to, right? Why? Because we're stubborn. Now, surprisingly, or perhaps not surprisingly, the people, they're not seemingly phased by these words of pursuit by God through his prophet Isaiah to them. They don't take his word into account. We see this in verses 9 to 11, right? Not only are they stubborn children, he says that you're, uh, your children are unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord. In fact, they seem to get a bit aggressive to anyone who wants to bring truth to them. They say, see or stop seeing. Stop telling us what you say is going to go wrong. Prophets, stop telling us what's right to do. Think about that for a moment. Think about the posture that they have in those situations. Instead, they say, you know what? Here's what we want to hear. We want to hear smooth things. We want to hear easy things. We want to hear that our way is going to prosper and go and God is with you. Like we want those words. Tell us illusions, right? It's like plugging your ears when a sibling's trying to correct you or or remind you of something your parents said. And you're like, blah, 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 I can't hear you. Blah, 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 I can't hear you. I don't know about you, but I did, I did that growing up. You can ask my sister. Uh, if she watches this, maybe she can chat something in there to, to say whether or not I've done it. But I, I'll just admit it. I've done that. Like, bah, you can't tell me what to do. I can't hear you anyway. And what was she trying to do? She was trying to tell me, hey, uh, this isn't going to go well. You need to you need to stop doing this. You need to, mom said to clean the room. You better have your room clean. Mom said to have homework done. You better have the homework done. Mom said to, you should really be doing, bah, 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 right? It's what the people are doing in response to truth being shared with them. And where did that lead? Well, it usually to uh, getting caught or to getting busted, getting disciplined, getting in some kind of punishment or trouble of some sort, right? The disappointment uh, that it led to in my mom, right? That's exactly what God says is going to happen. He says you're headed for disaster. That's what he says in verses 13 and 14, right? He says, go your own way. At some point, the walls are going to collapse. The whole thing's going to fall apart. Everything you worked for will shatter. He talks about these shards that are shattered. Now, when I was thinking about this, um, right now it's hunting season, and uh, a lot of people in our area, they go clay pigeon shooting, which is a target practice with a shotgun, and these little clay pigeons, they shoot out, and you try to hit it with your shotgun. And if you get the right shot, like a really good shot, and this thing just poof, just disintegrates in midair. Like, you don't even find shards. Uh, sometimes if you get a kind of a foul shot, you'll find pieces. But the idea here is, is that of like a perfect shot where there's a disc going and poof, million pieces, just nothing usable left because of the destruction that happens. All right now, here's my question. Does this sound like joy? Does this sound worth it to hold on to the way that we think we will find joy, the dangerous situations that we're willing to walk through and endure, right? To, it doesn't sound like joy to me. But here's the thing. God, thankfully, doesn't just warn us uh, that the way we're headed is going to be disaster. He, he goes a step further, right? He tells us the way to travel if we want joy, right? There's this call to return to him. He says, in returning and rest, I love these words. What, what gracious words from the Lord. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Meaning returning to him, to his ways, right? It means reading his word regularly. It means being in, in scripture for ourselves, reading through and hearing his words his words to us, his, his loving guidance to us. It means spending time in prayer, asking God, what do you think about this, Lord? How should I respond in this situation? What should I do here? Uh, how should I respond? Right? We look to him for guidance in the, 
in the little things and the big things, right? In all things. We want his guidance. It's getting his direction and then, I'm just getting his direction, right? That's just step one. It's getting his direction and then doing it. Even when it maybe doesn't make sense or it might not be what we want to hear, right? This is what he's saying. You want joy? Here's the path to walk. Walk in my ways. Walk on my path. But here's the truth this morning, friends. Sadly, many of us, even after hearing a message like this, we're likely not going to be moved. But rather, we're going to double down on our response. Just like the people of, of Israel, right? This word, unwilling. Right? Listen to this again, the ending of verse 15 and into 16. But you were unwilling. I'm willing to what? I'm willing to turn from your ways. I'm willing to turn back to God's ways to embrace what he wants from us. And instead, he says, no, we're going to flee on horses. No, we're going to just find our own strength. We're just going to find our own way. We're going to double down in what we think leads to joy. We trust in our own strength, our own thoughts, our own ways, only to experience more pain, more disillusionment, more frustration. Kind of makes you think, how broken do we have to get before we'll finally listen? Or maybe it's a sobering question. How broken do we have to get? How broken do situations need to become? Well, apparently we need to be shattered like a clay pigeon. But then what? Right? That's the message? That, that Where's the joy in that? Right? What hope is there for a shattered clay pigeon? That's a fair question. Hopefully you were thinking it or, or wondering well, it's found in verse 18. Here's the, here's the hope, right? The Lord waits to be gracious to you. That's the word of hope this morning. The Lord waits to be gracious to you. This idea of waiting has more of a connotation of looking forward to. This idea actually of a longing for. The Lord longs to be gracious to you, to shower you. He longs to shower you with his grace and his mercy, right? That's what a shattered clay pigeon looks forward to, is grace and mercy, because God's grace and mercy can do amazing things, and he longs to shower you with them. You know what? So much so, God himself came in the flesh, right? Wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. That's right, Jesus, right? And then he lives this perfectly faithful life of waiting on the Lord. He lives a life of waiting on the Lord, of following in his ways, of trusting in his ways, of walking in obedience and regardless of what's going on, knowing that that's the right thing to do. Like Jesus does this perfectly. And then he's crucified, right? It leads to his crucifixion. Where his own people turn on him. Other people abandon him. He's there hanging by himself. Even the father, it says, turns his face away, right? That pain, that agony, he feels the weight of all of our sins hanging on him. And then after he dies, right, it says that he was wrapped in grave clothes, laid in a tomb. Begins his life wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Ends his life wrapped in grave clothes, lying in a tomb. But here's the amazing thing. He doesn't stay in that tomb, right? Three days later, Jesus raises from the grave, conquering sin, conquering death, opening up that way for you and I to walk, to receive his righteousness and then walk in his ways. See, here's the thing. Not only does he pursue us in our rebellion, he's waiting and ready to scoop us up the moment we turn back to him with healing, forgiveness, wholeness, complete fulfillment, and overwhelming, abundant joy. Now here's what it says. It says, blessed are those who wait for him. This idea of waiting for him, again, has this connotation of who look forward to him, who turn back to him, who long to be with him, who long to walk in his ways, right? This is what it means to wait on the Lord, 
to keep doing the things that he wants us to be doing. And then it says, blessed are those who do this. And this, again, this idea of being blessed, this blessed is happy, joyful. So we can read this another way. Joyful are those who trust in God and follow him. So here's my question to leave you with this morning. What will you do? Which path will you start walking down? Right? Continue down your own path, your own ways of that you think are going to lead to joy that we just grip wholly, strongly to, right? You're going to keep walking down that way, even though we already know where that leads to destruction, to demise, to pain, to suffering, right? Maybe the question is, how much brokenness do you need to experience before you turn from your own ways? Because there is another option that God longs for all of us to take, to change course and head down his path. Now, maybe you're thinking, I have changed course. I am walking down his path. Well, that's awesome. I'm walking down his path too. But I got to also ask this question as follow-up. Am I walking down his path in all areas of life? In all relationships in life? Am I trusting his word and his ways with every person where I live, work, and play in all situations in life? Hmm. Probably not. There's probably some areas in your life, because I know they're there in my life, where I need to turn from a way that I think is going to lead to joy and surrender and walk in God's ways. Maybe you're thinking, Chris, I've tried it. It's not working. It doesn't work. Well, here's the thing. The way, the ways that God calls you and I to walk won't always look or appear to be effective. But you know what? It doesn't say blessed and happy and joyful are those who find the most effective way possible or seemingly most effective way possible, right? That's not what it says. It says blessed are those happy are those joyful are those who wait who wait on the lord meaning faithfully live out his words day in and day out see it is possible friends to be filled with joy even when things aren't going perfectly or just don't make sense but here's the thing there's only one way where this is possible god's ways but <laughs> Don't take my word for it. Why not walk on his way and experience this joy for yourself? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your great love. Thank you that you pursue us even in our rebellion. Thank you that you call us and beckon us and long and wait for us to turn back to you so that you can scoop us up, that you can give us healing and fill our lives with joy. Father, I pray for all of us. Show us where we are not walking in your ways and give us the courage to turn, trust, and follow you, to walk in those ways, to believe in Jesus, to receive his love. And more than that, to be over, uh, overwhelmed and abounding with your joy such that those in our own lives would experience and taste and feel your joy through each and every one of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. Love to see you throughout the rest of this Advent series. And as you go this week, I want to send you with this blessing. As you go, may joy abound in you as you seek the Lord with all your heart. Have a blessed week. Go in peace.